Hi, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. This week, the CDC has announced that children 5 through 11 are now eligible for the vaccine at the same time that President Biden has announced that companies with 100 or more employees must institute a policy where employees must get vaccinated by 4 January or be tested every week and wear masks in the office. Companies that fail to comply will be fined at a rate of just over $13,000 per person per month. This, of course, is setting up a battlefield with many Republican governors and the administration. For me, watching this weird political battle over the vaccine has been, well, weird. As always, my stance on all of this makes almost no one happy, but here it is. If you were my friend and you asked me what you should do, I would tell you that you should absolutely get the vaccine. I got it the second that I could, as did my wife and my kids. My seven-year-old is getting it as soon as a spot opens up, even though I'm well aware that his chances of having any real harm from, the, from getting COVID are, are minimal. Why? Because we've lost almost 700,000 Americans to COVID. That's 100 times more people that died in the entire 20-year war on terror. And pretty much once you get the vaccine, unless you're very old or have other illnesses, you, you don't die. That's pretty huge, guys. And we should stop pretending that it isn't huge. The drug cocktails that are starting to be used now when you get it and haven't been vaccinated are absolutely helpful and they're improving people's chances. But they pale in comparison to the efficacy of the vaccine. Now, many people point out there that being overweight is a huge part of why some people are dying. And that's true. And I think talking about that is important. Americans in general need to be healthier. We eat trash, but that's a different issue. But one of the reasons we get vaccines isn't just for our own health, but for those that we might spread the disease to. Vaccines work when most people have them. That leads us to the next question. Where does your freedom begin and end? Personally, I don't think anyone should be able to make you take the vaccine. My reasons are as follows. One, these pharma companies signed an agreement with the government that they cannot be sued for bad outcomes. I was fine with that in the emergency phase, but now that it has full FDA approval and there's gonna be consequences for people, that needs to go. Some people have died from the vaccines, as happens with all vaccines. It's not fair to force a vaccine on someone when they or their families cannot take action if there are negative consequences. Two, in the same way that it's not okay to force someone to give an organ to save someone else, it is not okay to force someone to take a foreign substance into their body without their permission, even if it could potentially help other people by them doing so. Three, we all have different risk profiles. To me, not getting vaccinated at this point makes no sense. To some of my friends, they'd rather play COVID chicken because they are healthy or they've already had it and have the antibodies. I'm not judging anybody for their call. But that brings me to my next point. Once you're a jerk about it, I am judging you because businesses and people can set whatever policy they want in their own bailiwick. If you walk into a store and their policy is wear a mask, then wear a mask. Your freedoms are not being infringed. Your choice is to go in with a mask or don't go in. If you throw a temper tantrum or cough in someone's face, you, you're the asshole. Conversely, if someone has an event at their home or their office and it's maskless and that's their policy and they've been open about it, and you go anyway and lecture everyone, you're the asshole and you just need to shut the f up. Just don't go there or don't work there or wear your own mask. There are limitless options. So if all of these businesses of their own volition made these rules, I'd be fine with it. Their company, their rules. You can vote with your actions and you can vote with your feet, but you can't dictate to them how they have to act. So the real question is, can the government dictate this law and supersede company and more importantly, state policy? I don't know. In a normal political climate, I think no one would have a major issue with the mandate, but in this political climate, I think you will see Texas and others counterman the policy, putting companies in a very bad place. The case will likely end up in the Supreme Court and will likely be the political hot button issue for the 2022 election cycle. Personally, I wish you would all shut up about this topic because everything that is going to be said about it has already been said about it. So why did I just say it? News broke when the body of a 19-year-old found in the trunk of a car was ID'd as the boyfriend of a man's daughter he killed. 
This wasn't your average take on a dad's threat to kill his daughter's boyfriend if he mistreats her, however. According to police, 60-year-old John Eisenman murdered the boyfriend after finding out that he had sold his daughter into a sex trafficking ring. Then he did what I imagine roughly any father would do. He obtained information that the boyfriend was responsible. He then went and rescued his daughter like goddamn Liam Neeson in the movie Taken. Next, he found out when the boyfriend was going to be in town again and waited for him. He abducted that asshole, stuffed him in a trunk, drove him somewhere, beat him to death with a cinder block, and stabbed him repeatedly. Then he drove the car off into the boonies and dumped it with a lifeless piece of excrement in the trunk. The remains were found a year later when some people discovered the vehicle and drove it back into civilization and left it in some neighborhood. Residents eventually wanted to see what was up with this random car in their neighborhood, poked around a little bit, and found a body in the trunk. There isn't much in the way of information as to how the father was brought in, but he's currently being held on a $1 million bond. I have two problems with this. One, this guy exacted unnecessary justice. Sure, we shouldn't promote vigilantism, but I feel like sometimes we can make an exception, as in this case. Two, a $1 million bond? There are people who have been allowed to walk on the same day for worse, and you're gonna jump on a dad who rescued his daughter? No one here thought anything backwards about that? The Tokyo trains drifted into tragedy this weekend after a man dressed as the Joker attacked multiple riders with a knife, pesticide, and lighter fluid, or as I like to call it, the triumphant. 24-year-old Kayota Hattori had decided he had reached the end after allegedly messing up at work a few months back. After that, he stated that his friendships and life in general fell apart and he wanted to die. The best way he saw fit to do that was to murder a few random people and hopefully get the death penalty. Kyoto boarded a train this past Sunday dressed as the Joker from Batman. His first victim, a 72-year-old man, was sprayed in the eyes with pesticide, then stabbed in the chest with a 12-inch knife. That man is in the hospital and is expected to survive, which in my opinion should be the real story here. I want to learn more about that guy. But continuing on, Kyoto Hattori made his way into another car where he doused lighter fluid on the seats and set the train car ablaze. Police arrived on scene where Hattori surrendered without incident. Aside from the absolute unit of a 72-year-old man, all other injuries consisted of mostly smoke inhalation. Hattori admitted he was inspired by a previous train attack in August where the attacker tried to use vegetable oil to set the train on fire but discovered it wouldn't consistently burn. Hattori has been arrested and is being charged with attempted murder, which while it won't warrant the death penalty, the punishment is no joke. But for real, this guy can't even kill people. He really is a loser. The Cap is back in the news after a bit of a hiatus from the media. With the recent announcement of his new Netflix special, some sound bites emerged that have captured the public's attention in classic Kaepernick fashion. At the forefront is a rant by the former NFL quarterback relating NFL coaches and owners to slave owners buying and selling slaves. Hell, if playing in the top ranks of football, being marketed by a megasport, and getting paid millions is slavery, sign me up. One of the direct quotes from Kaepernick revolved around coaches scrutinizing their players' performance. Really, bud? As one journalist pointed out, God forbid, a team that invests hundreds of millions in the hopes of putting together a winning roster put in the effort to determine that their investment is of value. There's apparently a visual comparison of the coaches shaking hands with slave traders and buying athletes in chains on a cotton field. Agree or disagree with Kaepernick's social and political stance, I find it hard to imagine anyone with a shred of logic agreeing with Kaepernick on the NFL Football League being akin to slavery. Millions of little boys across America don't dream of one day becoming an NFL superstar because they love slavery. College students don't play their asses off because they want to lose their freedoms and be subjected to torture. Millions of Americans from every possible ethnicity don't tune in and support their favorite players because they support slavery. It's just bull****. Kaepernick made his stance known and advocated for change. Even if you didn't like it, you have to respect it. But he sold out. You can't say it's a slave construct while at the same time taking millions from Nike and attempting to get signed by one of those slavery pushing teams, then blame racism because you, and only you, didn't get picked. Those slave chains you say you've got on are blinged out and cost more than the homes we can't afford to buy right now. You don't stand for the downtrodden when you make 19 million for playing a game and then call it oppression. You didn't quit. You tried to stay in and make that money. You just weren't chosen based on the assessment of the investment versus the return to include the hassle of controversy that comes with you. By all means, sir, 
Make your Netflix documentaries and peddle your victimhood to the willing. It is your right as an American. Just accept that it is our right as consumers to elect to watch or not watch and post our opinions that may or may not align with what you're pushing. And for clarity, that is also not slavery. Minneapolis has been at the center of justice reform since the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020. This week, voters were given the option to effect change in police reform in the city. Question two on the Minneapolis ballots was whether or not the police department and the charter governing them should be bluntly put abolished and replaced with a public safety department. The public safety replacements would have a greater focus on mental health and would act more as social workers than police officers. There's been a large amount of support drummed up for this measure over the past two years, so residents were unsure of how it might all go down. As the polls closed, however, the measure was defeated by a majority of 56%. Supporters of the measure blamed disinformation and fear-mongering as part of the reason why it didn't pass. Many spoke on the continued need for police reform. Opponents of the measure, who by and large aren't fans of the police, commented that the vague talk of just abolishing the police altogether would be worse than the current system. Violent crime has been on the rise in Minneapolis and residents are stoked about the idea of having no one to call or having a social worker show up to have a dialogue. Across the country, Democrats were also split in supporting the bill and the White House avoided addressing it. As of right now, the police will remain in Minneapolis, but the yes question two crowd has vowed not to give up, even though the majority of their peers and neighbors think it's a bad idea. I, for one, have seen a world where there is no police. It's called the purge. UC Santa Barbara has reportedly approved plans for a new student dorm. 97-year-old billionaire Charlie Munger has pledged to fund the construction of this new dorm under stipulations that it's designed the way he wants it to be. This is where the story gets weird. The dorm, to be named Munger Hall, would house 4,500 students in a 1.6 million square foot complex to the tune of one and a half billion dollars. Of all the rooms involved in housing these thousands of students, only 6% of the rooms have windows or access to natural light. Despite the size of the building, there are only two entrances to the building. Instead of windows, Munger suggests that monitors could play reels of starfish that will wink at you. The only spaces that would receive an abundance of natural light are a number of recreational areas that are planned for the perimeter of the building. It is because of these novel ideas that Dennis McFadden, an actual architect on the UC Santa Barbara Design Review Committee, decided to resign. He was quoted saying that the hall was unsupportable from his perspective as an architect, a parent, and a human being. He accused Munger of designing the dorm as a social and psychological experiment. Munger refuted these claims, stating that he has no designs on manipulating the minds and spirits of the lesser masses below him. He then announced that the recreation areas will only be given access to yearly winners of a competition he proposed called the Munger Games. The UN Climate Change Conference has been described as many things, but according to President Joe Biden, it might be the stuff dreams are made of. Biden did get up there and deliver a speech. He mostly apologized for Trump's behavior and touted his administration as the winds of change, as well as outlining the usual rhetoric on climate change agenda. But that's not what earned him headlines this week. Instead, it was his moments offstage that created a buzz on the busy webs of the worldwide. During the opening of the climate change conference, Biden was caught on camera, passing out in his seat. He fought a good fight, but ultimately succumbed to the heavy embrace of sleep. After a number of moments, an aide rushed over to wake him up. Reactions across social media platforms ranged from, who could blame him, that conference was boring anyways, to Biden critics slipping on the proverbial brass knuckles and taking shots at a visual representation of the moniker Sleepy Joe. Whichever side of the political aisle you lean, we can all agree that the climate change conference is probably boring as hell. That being said, come on, man. And finally, in Florida man news, a fight is brewing between Florida man Marvin Peavy and the Walton County Compliance Magistrate. Peavy, a middle-aged homeowner in South Walton community, has been flying two to three story tall banners on the front of his house. The prominently displayed banners read, Let's go, Brandon, and Trump won. Now the compliance magistrate wants them taken down, citing that it goes against the community standards. 
This decree has only emboldened Florida man and his fellow Florida men and women. Florida folk have begun to rise up in protest against the compliance magistrate, stating that it's Peavy's First Amendment right. Peavy himself has stated that it's his own personal views posted on his own personal property. The magistrate returned fire with a Florida county fine of $50 a day. Again, the Floridians would not comply and hundreds have pledged to help pay the fines just to keep the banners up. You could say it's been a banner moment in the South Walton community. The case is set to go before the local courts later this month, but with one woman pledging to pay two years worth of fines, it doesn't look like compliance can compete. Here's to you, large and excessive private property Florida banner men. And with that, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. Our news is at least as bad as the news you're getting already, and I will be attending the Patriots game this weekend. You probably don't care, but I hope they win. Let's go Mac Jones. As always, you can get 25% off at rangerup.com when you use the code BNN. And you can check out Nick and Matt at OnlyFans, where we basically have posted nothing recently. Have a great weekend.